All right, so, hi. Welcome to Creativation 2019. That's way too official. You know that. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to take you into the world of Distress Oxide. But when I do, I want you to understand that when it comes to a demonstration, which is what we're at, it's about giving you the high points, right? Not the everything point. Okay, there's so much more that can be done with this medium than what I can share with you in a single demo. Okay, But what's important to understand is that when it comes to any art medium, especially with Ranger, what I really love about working with a company that has chemists is the fact that we can take a product that does really well or a product that has a very cool effect and we can provide different delivery systems. And the delivery system is really how that product is applied, right? Oxide, when they were first launched, they came out in ink pads. And for anyone that has video from that very first time, I remember when I got these ink pads, as excited as I was about this crazy formulation of dye and pigment, I knew that how cool would this be if we could spray it. So it was almost like a five-year-old that just wasn't even happy with anything. And they're like, look at these cool ink pads. I'm like, these are awesome. Can I get that in a spray? And they're like, really? <laughs> like, we just gave you this. But for me, it was knowing that as cool as this is, if you can figure out how to spray it would be amazing on so many other levels. Now, an ink pad, that delivery system is perfect for stamping and blending. That's what they do because we have just that raised surface that's easy to control with a blending tool or a blending brush. It's a great way to apply colorant onto a surface. And whether you're doing a tag or whether you're doing really anything, we can just go in and have total control as to how that color is applied. That's the nice thing about an ink pad. Right? We can control that. If you have a stamped image, we can ink it and stamp it. But if you were doing a large project, if you wanted a background that just had a quick bit of color, you could achieve it with an ink pad, but it's gonna take you some time. It's gonna take you going in, blending this color, blending that color, spraying with water, adding this. So that's really why, especially in the art journaling movement, spray mediums became so popular. It was a very quick way to cover a large area with color and then build on top of it. The challenge with an oxide spray was the fact that because this is a dye and pigment that is reactive with water, so when I get this stuff wet, it's not only going to react like distress would, kind of create that wicking motion, it's also going to oxidize. It's going to start getting that white kind of hazy, chalky film over the top. The challenge was if we just added water to a reinker, it would have oxidized. So in the bottle, you would just pretty much be spraying out white. So I'm like, I need you to figure out some sort of colorant to dilute it, but I still want to be able to oxidize it if I choose. So it took them a couple of years, but hey, they're chemists. That's what they do. They figure that out. So the oxide spray really is a sprayable version of a distress oxide pad. It is not the same concentration as a reinker. Sprays never are. Just like distress spray stain is a sprayable version of a distress ink pad, but it is not the same concentration as a reinker. It's just not thick enough, right? So people right away, when I was doing Facebook Live, they're like, "Oh, so I can just reink my oxide pads by spraying?" And like, no, no, it's a, that's a reinker, okay? But what's important is when we want to create these cool, kind of funky, crazy backgrounds, you're going to love what the uh, oxide sprays do. And I want to share just a, a couple of different techniques. I'll do my best to just quickly go through a couple of cool features of the spray. So first of all, on this swatch book, and for those doing videos, kind of do the buddy system, fan it out, take your best money shot of that. But this is a great swatch showing you the 12 colors of the oxide sprays. And the nice thing, of course, anytime it's a spray, is a spray pattern. Like right away, that is a feature of a spray. Don't forget that that little speckly bit, that's why we want sprays. We want that little texture, okay? The other thing to note is that when this goes on, and you'll see when I start demoing it, it is still a dye in pigment, but pigment always dominates dye. So as I'm layering color, you're gonna see that if I have blue and I go with green, it's now green. And if I go on top of that with pink, it's pink on top of green on top of blue. You don't get that instant mud that you would with just using a translucent dye. So that feature of layering still exists even in a spray, which is kind of crazy. When you wet it, however, it will still oxidize. And that's what you can see down here on the bottom of all these swatches. That's just spray. That little area is where I added water. So you'll be able to see the, uh, the color and that color that's been oxidized, okay? And every time you add water to oxide, it will continue to oxidize. That's what we want it to do. 
All right, so now you understand kind of the basics of where we're, where we're going. Let's talk about just kind of some do's and don'ts. First thing when it comes to these little sprays, it will say on the side um, that you need to shake it side to side. Okay, because it's a spray bottle that requires significant shaking, if you shake it vigorously up and down, some of that ink can ooze out of the neck. Personally, I just don't have time to do this. Okay, if I had all of my colors, by the I would just be bored. I would need a nap. So what I do, as you can tell, doesn't really matter. Ranger's like, why do we even put it on the label when you tell them to do the totally opposite? I'm like, because you need to, I guess. I just take off the clear top, and I'm clarifying that because yesterday in class there was some confusion when I said remove the top. I didn't mean this. It happened. I just mean the clear top. Wrap that in a paper towel and shake it up, right? This way you can quickly mix that oxide spray and anything that leaked out would be caught in the paper towel, right? That's how I do it. You want to follow the instructions and shake side to side, that's fine. But now I understand when I tell a room of 100 people, remove the top of your oxide spray, I need to clarify the clear top. Because apparently... Did they then shake? Oh yeah, you know it, three of them. Oh. Yep. <laughs> three of them did, yeah. And of course, but honestly, I didn't notice any of them. It was the people that would help me in the room. They're like, did you see that lady in the second row? And she's like, she had ink everywhere. I'm like, how? She goes, well, when you told them to take off the top and shake it, she did put the paper towel over there, but it obviously wasn't enough to catch ink. And I'm like, I don't understand. She's like, no, she unscrewed the square. I'm like, oh my God. I go, well, you did say take off the top. And I'm like, but I meant like the little clear cap. I didn't say take out the sprayer. So you never know, right? Anyone that teaches, you know exactly what I mean. Sometimes it's like literal, and it was my bad. I did say remove the top. So it, what does that mean to you? I don't know. All right. So here, I'm not going to shake all the colors, but I just want to share with you, like, it's very, very quick. Um, what I'll try to show you, this one I haven't shaken up yet. You can only see a tiny little gap on that little side of the label, and I'll kind of go for each camera. That you can see what we have in here is a pigment and dye, all right? So the bottle itself, like Ranger wasn't really happy that it looked kind of crusty in the bottle. I actually like that. I mean, I can see that it's an oxide spray, but I can also tell if it's mixed or not. So once I kind of see some of that kind of bubbly stuff on the top, I know that it's mixed up. So you don't have to shake it for a long time, and you should shake it each time you go to spray it. It's not a mica spray though, so I don't want you to get confused of thinking, oh, I might clog up the nozzle if I don't shake it. It's really not that. It's about if you really want the true properties, of a dye and a pigment, you're gonna to wanna to shake it up. So, yeah, and look, nothing. But if it wasn't there, it could have been something. So don't take your chance. No, don't. All right, I'm gonna do a little watercolor paper and we're also gonna do just a tag just to show you. So what's cool about this stuff, and it's just crazy cool, is as I mentioned, the opacity, right? So as soon as I spray this, we're getting some insane color. And if I wanted to put a color on top of a color, I can do that. My green is still going to sit on top of that, okay? Is it ideal that we just continue to spray the same colors in the same space? No, that's not really what we're going for. You know, it's not this magic elixir. You could still make mud if you wanted to, but I do like the fact that when I go in and start spraying layers, that's just what I'm going to get. And I'm going to share with you a couple of things as we go through this demo. Obviously, I'm just going to drip a little bit of water just to get some color reaction. And then we're going to start drying this just to show you what we're going to end up with. Anytime we're working with any type of spray medium, you do want to work on somewhat of a protected surface. Do you need to work on a media mat? Not necessarily. Do you need to work on a splat box? Not necessarily, but just know that a spray is a spray. You're going to get some of that dusting. And this particular ink, this oxide spray, well, it's pretty concentrated. It tends to, I don't know, just kind of make this kind of chalky mud. But I don't mind it on the media mat at all. It's very, very easy to clean up. So what I want to show you as I'm going in, kind of drying this and getting this stuff to blend, is that this ink has that same crazy reaction, right? And you can see that all those colors that we initially sprayed that became this brown are starting to break back down to their true nature. You can see our orange, you can see some pink, you can see where I really blasted it with a lot of, the, a lot of blue. But anytime we have an art medium, and I think it has to do with just our creative culture, we get very caught up in what's new. Right? We're guilty of that, right? It's what's new, that's all I want to use, new, new, new. The thing that I'm not a huge fan of when it comes to working with anything new is sticking to one ingredient, right? Even as makers, you get this new toy and you forget everything else in the toy box. 
This is great, it's a cool background, but to me it's very one dimensional. It's very flat, it's this very soft, just kind of cloudy, dreamy background. Okay, that's kind of cool. But what if we mixed it with a stain? What if we took oxide and we added some translucent color? Well, that's a whole nother animal. And that is what I would encourage you to do. If you get some oxide sprays, maybe you don't have the budget to get all 12 of them right now. So choose colors that you don't have in a spray stain that you can kind of mix and match and then as you like it, build up the colors that you're going to ultimately want to use. So let's go in with these guys. That'll be fine. Take that. That'll work. And that'll work. All right. So this one we're just going to go in and do a little bit of mixing as well. One of my favorites. Ice spruce. We use this in class. This is a really good one. Ice spruce is nice and, and it seems like a strange color when I only started with 12. Like why would I do this color? Uh, ice spruce is that chameleon color. Maybe it's weathered wood. Maybe it's hickory smoke. It doesn't really know what it wants. It depends on what you put it next to as the color it looks. So, you know, when I had to start with 12, 12 out of 60, that's a tough call, man. That's a tough one. Like, what pink do you want? You know, do you want more lipstick? I'm like, it depends on my mood, right? So here I'm just gonna go in. I'll spray a little bit of oxide. Now I'm gonna go in with some spray stain. Right, we can see that dye right away. Get rid of those clear caps. We don't need that. Get some ink on there. And maybe I'll go in with another oxide spray. A little bit of color there, a little color there. Mm, I like that. And let's take a little bit of fire brick there. All right, and I know people are like, I would never put that much garbage on one page. I would. I like that. I think more is better. So at this point, we have kind of a combination of dye and pigment, and we could even see on the media mat kind of what's going on, right? When that dye, it doesn't really act like a mixative, but when that dye and that pigment get together, they want to push away from each other, right? If it's part of the, the same formulation, and that's the other thing, this is formulated for these dye and pigments to work together, and if you're not a chemist, which I'm not, I don't know why that is. Why is it, it's a dye and pigment, why wouldn't this dye just kind of, whoops, jump into the other one? I don't know, but it doesn't. And what's cool about this, when we start really going in and drying this background and adding that water, is we're gonna see where we have more concentration of dye and where we have more concentration of pigment. And my suggestion, whenever you're doing some backgrounds, give it a little time to kind of do its thing, right? Don't be so quick to dab, dab, dab. That's gonna take it all off. Because I love what's happening right now getting that kind of creamy, dreamy look of the oxides, but that intensity of that dye, that color it right there. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She's going to be so embarrassed. It's red now. She's out of here. Yeah, that's Chow. Amy Tangerine's mom, adorable. She's so adorable. She always comes in. She gets so mad if I stop demoing. Look. She's, love you. She's gonna scold me texting. She's gonna be like, you should not have stopped. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so this, and right now we're just working on paper, because I'm gonna show you another way when we don't work on dry paper, and for those in the class, I mean that, you know I would've put a piece of paper in there. Yeah, the, the, thing, yeah, the thing about a media mat that's different than a craft mat is because it's glass, you do have the ability to make a print, right? So you can spray that and lay paper and pretty much pick that off exactly as it was. This is just killing me right now. But I have a purpose, I need to demo. I'm not here to make, I'm here to demo the product. Okay, so what we have here, compared to this, is a different depth of color. Can you guys see that? I mean, I get it, it's still color, and I get that it's still oxidized, but here we've got a lot of highs and lows. We've got some really deep colors. We've got even some bright greens popping through. We've got some deeper blues. And that's because if you use dyes in conjunction with oxide, you just get way more depth than where it just looks like a flat piece of cream. So there's no right or wrong, but I do want to encourage people when you get a new medium, really try to play around with those dye and pigments because I think you're going to be happier with the result. And as always, because it is an oxide or anything distressed, it will continue to react. So if I just keep spraying this area, you kind of see that little pink area, I'm getting those colors to re-wet, I'm getting that color to blend, so if I wanted to push some of that color over there, I can do that. So don't think that you have to stick with what you have. You can always go in and re-wet it, but what you need to understand with an oxide is the more water, the more it will oxidize. 
So at some point you will have it so wet that it does look really washed out. Maybe that's what you're going for. And I do like that as well, which is for the most part, the colors I chose were pretty bold. I mean, the pink I chose was a brighter pink, the red I chose because I can always fade it out with water, but if I started with, say, spun sugar, you know, tumbled glass is my blue, bundled sage is my green, you wouldn't get intensity at the beginning. But see how my background already changed? And look at that really cool oxidation where I just kept blasting it with water, right? If I show you in that same area, you'll see that water and oxide, that's magic. People go, it's not doing anything. I'm like, just keep blasting it with water. You'll get it to do its thing. All right.